This morning we have, I think, a very interesting and important subject involving human relations at their very core, the very foundation of our lives with other people. From a standpoint of anthropology, loneliness and aloneness represent two rather difficult and different situations. Primitive man was alone. He probably was never aware, however, of loneliness as we know it, unless perhaps the very beginnings of it began to stir within his nature. As far as we know, society is the result of the gradual rising of this sense of isolation and the determination of the individual to overcome it in some way. Most animals are alone, although we do find that some animals do become lonely. And uh, we know many cases where an animal has pined and died as a result of the loss of its mate or as a result of the loss of some human association which has become tremendously important to it. Thus we find that the beginnings of certain neurotic tendencies towards aloneness do arise within the animal kingdom. Actually, primitive man also lived in an environment in which his relations to other persons did not stimulate any internal morbid reaction. If he was alone, so were all others. It did not occur to him that he was particularly, specially deprived of any relationship which others enjoyed. We know that aloneness probably resulted in a kind of physical danger. Uh, the individual, entirely isolated, was less able to protect himself and his values in life. Gradually, therefore, human beings formed associations for protection, for comfort, for security, and for all these different exterior motivations, which also still survive among us. As a result of community strength, society as we know it had the opportunity to evolve. And as this community strength gradually reduced the labors of individuals, leisure appeared. And leisure was time for reflection. Well, time for reflection is wonderful if you have anything to reflect upon. But time for reflection without an adequate internal life is just plain misery and boredom. We know this also, even in our present way of life. Thus, the challenge of the unfolding of our own inner resources has always spurred us on to further adjustments and to further association patterns with those around us. Some persons are naturally so constituted that aloneness means very little to them. They have lives of sufficient depth or of sufficient lack of depth so that they do not experience the, the neurotic pain or sorrow of isolation. There are others, however, who from the very beginning of life are in desperate need of companionship, who require certain associations to maintain their own integration, their own integrity. And in this union for strength, we observe one of the anthropological symptoms. As man increased in thoughtfulness, as his interior mental life strengthened, he became more observant of things around him and more reflective upon the meaning of various occurrences. This rise of the importance of meaning began to affect his personal thinking and his personal orientation. Uh, the development of leisure the opportunity and time for thought, and the attendant factor of the gradual increase of education. These processes, always working in life, causing us to unfold our abilities and our intimations in our own nature, our inclinations, our attitudes, our instincts, and our impulses, all of these brought man closer and closer to a broad social pattern. And today we are held in that pattern 
very largely. However, the mind, which is the basis of our individual life, is also a very tyrannical faculty and probably contributes the most uh, to aloneness or loneliness when it is misused or is not properly guided and directed in its own training. In the last 25 years particularly, the educational world has taken a great deal of interest in adjusting young people. The time to become aware of our social place in the world is when we are young enough uh, to be free from unreasonable prejudice. Under normal conditions, it has been noted that very few children suffer from these mental restraints which frequently can lead to the state of loneliness. The child is an accepting creature. The child has not yet developed unreasonable prejudices. It has not isolated itself socially. It has not developed any consciousness of a class system or a caste system. It does not appreciate or understand or care about the various problems of religious or racial segregation. Thus the child is by nature normally and happily seeking associations around it. This of course is in some ways a very desirable trait. In other ways it has to be conditioned or modified to some degree so that discretion or discrimination or conscience or sense of values uh, will step in and give the child protection against undesirable associations. In all, however, we note that the average child is gradually conditioned toward a sense of isolation. This conditioning is sometimes due to simply taking on the attitudes and prejudices of its elders. Very often the child is forbidden to associate with certain other children, is forbidden to accept members of other re uh, religious or social levels, and uh, in the course of the last 2,500 years of history particularly, it seems that what we commonly know as theology has had a very powerful influence in segregating people, keeping them apart. For hundreds of years, the various religions of the world were highly prejudiced, and in the actual association between them, we see a complete lack of basic social understanding. We observe persons worshiping almost identically the same principles and yet unable to meet in any kind of basic fraternity. About the only way through this dilemma has been disaster or some major crisis which has caused the humanity in man to rise above all artificial considerations. We may live under pressure, but we do not always live under a crisis sufficiently intense to bring about this broadening of perspective. If the child grows up under very intensive uh, example domination or surrounded by persons highly prejudiced or opinionated, the child gradually loses its broader social adjustments. We know today that a poorly associated and a, a poorly oriented child is going to face a much more difficult life than he would if he had been brought up in a more balanced and perhaps basically more liberal atmosphere. We also decide as we go along the kind of people we like to know and all too often the people we like to know are the people most like ourselves. This is bad usually. It brings us into ever smaller patterns of acquaintances. It makes it more difficult for us to become uh, balanced as social beings. I think probably in our particular field of activity, this difficulty arises subconsciously from the person trying to find others whose interests are similar to his own. He feels that his own peculiar philosophy of life is a rare and beautiful thing. Therefore, he wants to share it with others who may not want it. Also, he wants to draw his friends and those close to him 
from individuals on the same levels of interest. Well, there is a great deal to be said in favor of this, but there's also a great deal to be said in the favor of a broader uh, contact than this. Actually, we are not in our wisest and best position uh, when we surround ourselves with people who agree with us, or at least agree with these things which we consider important. If we happen to be wrong in some of our opinions, and we are surrounded only by others making the same mistake, this mistake can continue unchanged and unremedied throughout life. And after a time, we reject empirically any individual who might bring us a broader point of view in relationship to our own thinking and opinions. Emerson was, I think, quite wise when he pointed out that we should take the attitude that we can learn something from everyone. And this does not mean we have to copy their faults. It means that if we have some basis of integrity within ourselves, we will observe also that other persons, though they may differ from us, though they perhaps may disagree with us rather violently, that these persons have ideas and values that it would be good for us to know. I think it is a mistake for people uh, to base their associations entirely upon compatible factors. This is the easy way. It is the way in which there seems to be less stress and strain, but it is also the way of least personal growth, least instruction, least value from life. We each of us live in a world composed of an infinite diversity of different things. Yet these differences are all suspended from certain great unities, from certain great identities. It is important for us to be able to discover these identities, to be able to discover the truths and the things we do not know, the truth in the persons we have not yet met. And much of it depends upon a certain liberality, a certain insight within our own natures. If we lack this insight, we will gradually reduce our circle of social existence. This does not mean that we have to copy the bad habits of other people, nor does it mean that we have to compromise our principles. Usually, however, it does mean that we have to have a sympathetic ear. We have to have a degree of insight which enables us uh, to sympathize or understand persons who disagree with us. As long as our friendships and our relationships are built upon identity or similarity, we are likely merely to perpetuate our present way of life. If we were here merely to be comfortable, it is obvious that we should avoid all uncomfortable situations. But if we are here to learn, if we are here to enlarge consciousness, as much as possible during the course of a lifetime, then we achieve this end most directly by placing ourselves continuously in situations that are a little too big for us. Not so large that we founder about in them in despair, but large enough so that they challenge us, so that they force us to estimate values in terms of other centers than our own center of consciousness. It is also well known that man is a very versatile creature. Each one of us has locked in him the potential of all achievement. We can do anything. Many of these things that we can do, however, we have never trained ourselves to do. Therefore, these potentials remain latent. Through association with dissimilar interests, we are stimulated to release some more of this potential in ourselves. We can develop new and important attitudes toward life. The reason for our philosophy and our religion, the real reason, is that we shall have the courage to face new things. The real reason is not that we should cling to it desperately and reject everything that differs from it. Also, we have to be very careful in our philosophy of life 
not to impose our, our own ideas upon others. The moment we begin to interfere with the right of another individual to live, we are likely to lose the friendship of that person. We are likely to be estranged from our children and our relatives, and our family may be broken up as a result of our insistence upon conformity by others. This problem of conformity perhaps contributes more to loneliness than any one other factor in the life of civilized man. We are divided today into a series of conformities, into patterns uh, to which we have certain moral allegiances and toward which we hold a virtue of patriotic dedication. Thus we consider ourselves just little better citizens if we uh, find ways in which our way of life is more important than any other man's way of life. We feel that religion requires that we shall be true first to our own cult. We believe that the laws of society require that we shall advance our own culture at the expense of other cultures. And whenever it is necessary for us to decide a uh, value, to decide what is better, it is our moral duty to decide that our own way is better. Uh, this makes us considered very dedicated citizens, but it can also separate us from much that is wonderful and beautiful in the life we live. The Constitution of the United States grants us the right to individual existence and grants us the right to live our own lives insofar as we live without interfering with the rights and privileges of others to think and to live and to speak as we see fit. Our only Restraint is that of good taste, of propriety or morality. We have in this country, for example, over 500 Christian sects and representatives for probably 25 or 50 non-Christian religions. These people live together, work together. Their children go to the same schools. These persons have formed a commonwealth. And within the structure of this commonwealth, each is making his own contribution. We have no right, therefore, to question the privilege of these persons uh, to the fulfillment of their faiths according to the conviction of conscience. Now, it may happen, and does happen, that we are not in agreement with these people. We may not believe that their faith is as good as they think it is, but they have the same right in relation to ourselves. They have a right to regard us as suffering from certain delusions or less enlightened uh, than they are in, our, in their believing and in our believing. If we allow the situation to rest on this level, we will be strangers all our lives, and we will lose some splendid opportunities uh, to understand other people and the internal vital principle which moves them in the cultivation of their own way of life. Thus, tolerance. <laughs> a sincere understanding which does not prevent us from keeping our own faith but causes us to simply rejoice that other persons likewise have strong and deep convictions. Such an attitude is far wiser. When we examine all these groups of believers, we observe that they are in common accord on practically every important problem of morality and ethics. They follow the same commandments. They worship the same God. Uh, they perform the same essential religious virtues. They are differing largely in name and creed or in some small mechanical part of their conviction. Thus, we do not need to emphasize these points of difference. It is far wiser for us to search for the larger points of agreement and to work together for the mutual benefit of each other. Thus it is very important in any country that does not have a state religion or is not dominated by one particular branch of believing. It is very important that persons living under religious liberty should also learn 
interreligious understanding. For it is only by this means that we can gain some of the most important consolation of our lives. As we grow older, religious and philosophical factors become more important in giving us a full and interesting life. During the very busy years of accumulation or of industry, of labor, we may not have too much time for such considerations. But as we grow older, we become more dependent upon our own internal resources. And among these resources, religion and philosophy are most important. Therefore, in order to enjoy these things, we must put ourselves into an attitude in which we are not constantly aware of religious restriction or limitation in other people. We cannot build too much dogmatism without having an attendant uh, diminution of happiness and adjustability in our various lines of life and action. Also, the tendency of the person as he grows older is to reduce the area of his interests. His tendency also is to fall into conveniences. He no longer wishes arduous decisions. He wants to drift along as comfortably and pleasantly as possible. At the same time, he has more leisure than ever before, and usually he has been deprived of the principal crutches for which he used to, to, to depend upon in order to keep himself occupied. We observe psychologically this peculiar situation in which the individual tries to be happy by forgetting himself. Not forgetting himself in the service of others, but in the various occupations which have become important to him in his daily existence. Thus the businessman falls back upon his business as his great interest in life. It supplies him the challenge. It supplies him the motivations. It keeps the mainspring of his own nature wound up. It gives him continuous outlet. He is able within a comparatively restricted area of familiar things to create a life. And this life has particular value to him because it is also his way of livelihood. And with the various responsibilities that he has assumed along the way, this way of livelihood becomes his principal defense against reflection or falling into the sense of his own internal inadequacy. He is not much concerned uh, with his uh, various cultural elements because he does not sense the terrible pressing need for them. The same is true of the average homemaker. The woman who is raising her family, who is bringing up her children, has a world of activities in this direction. She has found her usefulness. She has found the expression of her various instincts. And she is always able, if necessary, to create a few imaginary worries to keep herself busy on this level. Uh, she may have real problems. If she does not have real ones, she will make a few. And she will make certain small things seem large in order that she may have large purposes. Gradually, however, both of these situations change. The man reaches that period in life in which he either retires from business or begins to let go, turning the responsibilities over to younger people. The woman, in turn, finds that her children have grown up, that her worrying and responsibility uh, have ceased or at least considerably diminished. She is therefore deprived of the principal activities of life. It is perhaps in a case like this that these two people, the man and the woman, meet in their late 50s or early 60s on a level that they have previously never known each other. They meet as two persons with time, with leisure, and with very little interior organization with which to face life together. Their previous togetherness, so to say, has been nothing more or less than pressing responsibility, which has held them in a pattern of duty 
and uh, work, endeavor, each one has found a certain security in the problems that they themselves were carrying. Now they suddenly find themselves uh, brought together to determine not what they will do under the pressure of need, but what they will do under a condition of comparative relaxation. They may very well discover that at this time either one or both of them is without resource. That this individual uh, person has not built close bridges of true sympathy and understanding with their partner. Each now with leisure becomes a problem. The man sitting around the house all day uh, is in trouble. He not only is in trouble as far as he is concerned, but he becomes a new and rather mysterious factor in the home which the woman herself has not previously experienced. She probably has difficulty dusting under his chair now because he's sitting in it. And one by one, these little details can assume rather serious proportions. Also, there is a vaguely negative situation in wandering about without proper activity. You cannot manufacture this kind of activity. You can mow the lawn once, but you can't mow it every half hour. You can putty around the house until it's painted, and the screens are all in, and then there is nothing more to do. And these persons who were busy suddenly are not busy. And they have to look back over the fact that in the process of being busy over a long period of years, they failed to lay any foundations for this true leisure which was inevitably to come to them. They were not growing as persons uh, at the same rate as the years were moving by. And such individuals can be very lonely. Very lonely in common association. Very lonely in relationship to other persons for much has been sacrificed in this tremendous effort to meet the emergencies of daily living through the years. The situation can suddenly become acute also if one of these persons should pass on. Then the other one may well be left completely inconsolable, unable to adjust to any situation, and ready to fall into the most dangerous of all psychological attitudes, and that is self-pity. Other situations also present themselves as we go along. But I think that one of the main patterns of our loneliness today is the lack of social education or social experience as we go along through the busy years of life. If we have not established some values, we are in trouble. Now many persons have attempted, either as they went along, or perhaps more directly when the problem came to their immediate consideration, uh, to secure a solace or contentment through turning to religion or philosophy or to some form of mystical thought. This, under those conditions, is generally not adequate because actually n neither religion nor philosophy functions under an ulterior motive. And the motive of learning merely for pleasure or comfort to self or to meet an emergency, while it is common motive, is not the best motive. It generally means that we bring to our subject a desperation or a despair, or we cling to it as we might cling to a, a spar of wood in the sea if we are drowning. This clinging to something lest we drown is not the right approach to any value that is really important to us. Our desperate effort creates too much tension in ourselves. We go overboard. We become unbalanced in our desperate desire for comfort or consolation. Not having any foundation in adequate thinking on these subjects, we are also easily deluded and many persons have been bitterly disillusioned as the result of these desperate efforts to find some kind of religious or spiritual solace. If we are 
to use these subjects wisely. We should use them throughout life and not turn to them as novices when life itself is nearly finished. To meet, therefore, the need of our own personal living, we have to begin to build a philosophy of life as we build a business, as we build a home, as we build a family. If we began this building earlier, we would have fewer broken homes and fewer economic failures. We find that limiting our perspective to such a degree of one-pointedness that we gradually lose sight of a larger life is a mistake. We must always remember that we live in a great universe and that we are here to learn, to learn all that we can possibly accept of universal knowledge. Our economic system presses in upon us very desperately. Yet every year, various protections are given to us uh, by which we gain more and more freedom of action and greater and greater opportunity for self-expression. Under the organization of labor today, working hours have been markedly reduced. We are no longer in the difficult situation of our ancestors. A hundred years ago, a man worked from light till dark usually from six to six for a dollar a day or less, six days a week. Under such conditions, it is natural that he might be rather exhausted. It is also true that in the home, devices and conveniences, the streamlining of our living, the reduction in the size of homes, the gradual disappearance of large estates, and various other modern trends, are releasing the average woman from many of the burdens and responsibilities that once took up most of her time. The average person of today in the home would feel very unhappy if they had to bake the bread in a stone oven, if they had to weave the cloth and make the clothes for the family, if they had to go out in spare time, milk the cows, feed the chickens, and do all the things that once formed the common family problem. We do not have this anymore, particularly in urban life. We are living ever more conveniently and with greater freedom. It is therefore safe to say that it is within the possibility of the average person of today to enlarge the field of his cultural interests even from earlier life. It is perfectly possible for the young man or young woman starting out to have a measure of leisure a measure of time. Now we like to conceal this situation under a rather platitudinous concept, namely that while we have more time, the pressure of situation gives us greater exhaustion. Therefore that even with these shorter hours, we find at the end of the day that we are worn out, tired out, and no longer capable of taking advantage of cultural opportunity. This, I believe, is fundamentally and basically untrue. There are a few instances in which it probably is true, but for the overwhelming majority of persons of what we call middle-class society today, this is not true. And it is this group which makes up the majority of our population. The actual fact is that the work we are doing does not interest us. We find no personal satisfaction in the tremendous and rapid development of our industrial way of life. We are not really tired. We are not really exhausted. We are bored. And under the pressure of boredom, we follow one of the most simple of all psychosomatic patterns. We try to sleep it off. And if we cannot sleep it off, we will eat it off. We must do something to compensate for the fact that we do not have a cultural life. We may not know we want it. We may arise from a level in which our ancestors never had it. But at the same time, the individual is a living soul, a being in a body, a mind and an emotional integration which demands rights, demands mental life, demands emotional self-expression demands certain liberties and rights and privileges of thought and action. 
And unless the person has these rights and privileges, he gradually falls into a state of interior discouragement. He becomes disinterested and indifferent. He loses the vitality to strike out and take care of his own needs in an adequate manner. Thus we find persons drifting through the years as assuming that they have no time. Yet these same persons have time to do anything they want to do. The lack is there of desire to do. I saw some recent uh, figures to indicate something of the time element that has arisen from television alone. The number of hours uh, that are devoted to television viewing in this country are, uh, well, this number is almost unbelievable. Some figures have estimated that television is taking from one to three hours a day out of the lives of between 50 and 60 million people. Now that's a lot of people. And furthermore, it is probably going to grow, and yet with it is growing the greatest discontent that we've ever had on any level of entertainment. As Walter Winchell said not long ago, it has only taken television five years to become as bad as it took radio 25 years to become. And uh, in large measure, this represents a basic truth. The individual with no time, no energy, and no interest can, devow, can devote from one to four or five hours a day to the contemplation of the finest assortment of murder, rape, and mayhem that has ever been exposed to the public. He calls this recreation <laughs> and is unaware of the fact that the psychologist is paid from ten to twenty dollars an hour to listen to what he is listening to. <laughs> and as a result of that, the psychologist has to take two months vacation or a year or become one of the victims himself. <laughs> It is useless, therefore, for us to say that the individual has no time. For any one person who really has no time, there are a hundred having time, but doing nothing with it. Why is this nothing such a very large factor in our way of life? It is because of indoctrination, of example, the pressure of circumstances, the general brainwashing that we get as we go along through the years, and this doc indoctrination of meaninglessness under which we all come. This doctrine that nothing is important. Uh, this doctrine that everything is going to finally end in confusion and chaos. Also this creeping materialism which is getting more and more infective to the fact that anything we do is futile anyway because after a little while we'll be gone and no one cares. Under such attitudes, it is not possible for us to develop a healthy or normal social existence. Young people are conditioned before they have a chance to live. Their values are distorted. And as a result of that, young people are unable to find appropriate associations among their own kind. Everywhere we turn, the superficial, the psychotic, is taking leadership. And under the pressure of this attitude, uh, we have very difficult time building lasting friendships that are secure, reasonable, right, and proper. The individual in this kind of a situation has to do some thinking for himself. And more persons every day are faced with this kind of thinking. Loneliness as a basic situation has many byproducts. And these byproducts are not good unless we have made them good. Loneliness can rapidly degenerate into even more complicated psychotic situations. The individual who is lonely is testing every fiber of his psychological integration. And there are very few such integrations that can stand too much testing without simply breaking. We find, therefore, 
a whole variety of mental, psychological, emotional, and physical ailments arising from this forced sense of isolation. We find that the person is not healthy, not well. And as their psychology falls apart, they become even dangerous to those around them. They become spreaders of psychic toxin. They infect healthy people. And in their desperate effort to find something to do, they become burdens upon themselves and everyone else. We do not really believe, basically, that the average person can use religion as a complete buffer against all of this problem. We are leaning too heavily upon our own religious equation. It's just like a person trying to fill his life by reading from morning till night. He really cannot do it. He soon develops a kind of literary indigestion, which is very painful and may turn him in the end from all literature and all reading. He cannot bury himself in some preoccupation that keeps his mind off of himself forever. This is especially true if the thing he is doing is not real, even to himself. There are persons who are keeping busy on projects they do not believe in, who have never really sold themselves. They consider their activity merely as a way of forgetting at the moment something else that is more unpleasant. Naturally, such outlets have very little permanent value. An outlet for loneliness or for isolation in order to be valuable has to be balanced on several levels of function. We have to have not only mental and emotional expression, we have to have physical expression. The person who is in reasonable health must have meaningful physical activity as well as mental and emotional activity. He must have outlets into the world around him. The lonely person loading themselves with psychological self-improvement loading themselves with philosophical insight and religious enthusiasm. Such a person finally reaches an overload. And because they have no way of applying what they are learning to the daily problems of action, they become more and more theoretical and can easily fall into fantasy and hallucination. There must be outlets for things. What we believe must lead to an action appropriate to what we believe. There must be usefulness, there must be vitality, or learning itself becomes utterly sterile and stagnant and may turn and pollute us uh, for lack of circulation or lack of proper motion within consciousness. So we always realize that while the individual lives, he must have outlets. He must have valuable means of bridging between himself and other persons. We also know that an individual who never expresses himself, who keeps more and more within his own counsel, who is locked, who has developed a strong protective or defensive mechanism against those around him, must be alone. No one else can break through such barriers. And very often the loneliness is due to the barriers that we have built. But as we do not wish to face this, we turn and accuse society. The person who is barricaded behind a concept uh, generally does not uh, fight a battle. If we could only stand back there hurling round shot at each other, we would feel that we had plenty to do. But when we get a fortification built that high and that deep and so well established, uh, other people do not even attack it. They just walk away and leave us behind it. And uh, we find ourselves not a valiant adversary, but an ignored one. And this is most humiliating. We can stand almost anything better than we can stand being ignored. But we are ignored when it becomes obvious 
that nothing that anyone else is going to do or can do will have any effect upon the armament we have created within ourselves. Even persons who have other doctrines which we object to might try to convert us under normal conditions, but when they see the barrier that we have built, they decide that we are not worth converting or that it is necessary to leave us to the fine work of heaven, so that we are simply left to heaven. And this is not as enjoyable as we thought it was going to be. So if we are finding ourselves at any age of life drifting towards a sense of isolation, if we find that we are no longer able to find people with whom we even want friendship, if we begin to look upon all people as though we were in an ivory tower and the first thing we notice about everyone is what is wrong with them, we better begin to uh, think a little bit because we are heading toward many years of isolation. And nature, because of the way in which it is trying to teach us, has a rather unpleasant habit of leaving us here as long as possible under those conditions. There seems to be always the hope we may learn something. So nature, instead of releasing us from this misery in our 60s or something like that, is liable to keep us hale and hearty and unhappy at 90. <laughs> Nature just will not let go of the hope that somewhere along the line we're going to learn something. And it is more economical to leave us here to learn it than to go all through the processes of bringing us back. So here we sit until the fullness of time or arteriosclerosis finally gets us. So do not assume that a miserable life will terminate quickly. It probably will not. There's an old saying, you know, that only the good die young. And there is something, perhaps, of truth in it. The more we crystallize ourselves and lock ourselves, uh, the more difficult it is even for the changes of experience to pry us loose. And we have a wonderful tenacity to stay with it to the bitter end. Therefore, we might as well take the bitterness out of it now and end this entire difficult situation. If, therefore, there is a little indication showing up, we should begin to look into our own natures and see if we can find what is wrong. For people coming in with problems of loneliness and aloneness are usually, in my experience with them, just a little inclined to be hypocritical. Uh, you begin to hear the sad story of how uninteresting other people are. You begin to hear the sad story of how these worthy souls have been imposed upon, how they have been variously ill-treated, how they have gradually become disillusioned, how the few friends they had exploited them, and little by little you get the full benefit of their a very unhappy, very miserable experiences. You have to realize that something is wrong, because if this was really the pattern of life, then everyone would come in with a story. But the only persons who come in with this story are persons of one basic type. There is a certain kind of character that gets into this trouble. And by character, in this case, I am not using the argo. I am meaning a kind of characteristic that develops this situation and makes it constantly uh, a problem for themselves and others. There will be other people come in with problems, but another type of character combination will come in and say that they haven't a minute's peace because other people are at them all the time for something. They have more friends they know what to do with. They have more interests than they can ever take care of. They come in and say, do something to slow me down. Show me how I can get rid of some of the things I'm doing, because I'm doing too much. The other individual comes in and says, show me something to do. There is absolutely nothing worth doing in life. Now, this cannot mean that these persons are living in a different universe. They are not. They are living in one world. 
And there has to be a reason why this difference of attitude is present. Very often, you can trace it back into small childhood. You can see this child potentially going to be a lonely person. You can see how their own instincts have caused them to be shy or hypersensitive or hypercritical. These are the children that cannot take correction from their parents or are broken-hearted at the slightest unkind word. These are the kind of persons who go off for themselves whenever an emergency arises and just simply feel bad about it. In the beginning, they do not particularly feel bad about anyone. They just hurt. And there are persons who seem to be born with that kind of a psychic nature which is ever available for hurt. Things that other people pay no attention to become tragedies in their lives. I remember one case in which two sisters were both musicians, both played the violin. There were about four years of life difference in age between these two. The older sister began studying the violin when she was 16. At this time, her younger sister was 12. This younger sister has carried through all her life the fact that her elder sister got to practice sooner than she did. It caused a hatred against that elder sister that was never forgiven. The parents felt that 12 was a little too young. Maybe they were wrong. But it was certainly not an intentional partiality. And when the younger sister was the same age, 16, she was allowed to practice just the same as her older sister. But the fact of age difference meant nothing to that younger child. It was definitely persecution, misunderstanding, favoritism. And those sisters, when they grew up, the younger sister did not speak to the elder sister for over 40 years, just over something of this nature. Now, you cannot say that this was simply anybody's reaction to a circumstance. It was a highly conditioned reaction. Nor was it an isolated incident. The story of the younger sister from the cradle was one of this peculiar hypersensitivity and hypercriticism. Naturally, by the time this younger woman grew up and assumed the responsibilities of life, this hypersensitivity moved into every pattern they had. And in the closing years of life, they lived alone, hardly seeing a soul. And their only subject of conversation was what was wrong with everything. It was a characteristic. Now, young people, children, with this temperament, should be brought under counsel and advice early. They should, if possible, be prevented from carrying this into maturity because it is an almost certain cause for isolation. These persons will never be warm, friendly, happy people. And no amount of sacrifice, no amount of daily work, no desperate effort, to do the works of duty and obligation to the bitter end will make these people well liked because whatever they do they do it so heavily they do it with such a morbid quality in the doing that very often folks just wish they wouldn't do it at all They're, these people become the good people whom no one appreciates because their goodness is so heavy so tiresome, so loaded with melancholy, so completely devoid of true friendliness uh, that uh, even their best efforts and their best labors frequently lead to disaster. They simply do not have the knack for living. Now, it's possible that a good many persons have passed the age when this preventive policy can be applied in midstream or in later years, uh, the lonely person uh, suddenly realizes some of these things to be true, but is then powerless uh, to make the necessary adjustments. 
We should not say powerless, but we should point out that the older we become, the less easy it is to change our ways. Therefore, to move from a situation into one totally different requires sometimes greater effort, greater energy, greater vision uh, than we possess. However, as a compensation for these more mature years, we do have experience and insight. We also have, perhaps, uh, as so many of this type of person does cultivate religious interests, we have more spiritualized interpretation of value. There are things we can do if we can ever get ourselves into the mood to do them. Thus, if we are already a little on the lonely side of things, it might be good somewhere along the line to sit down and look back through years and try to see what is under the pattern. There are always one of two or three root causes. The first and most common is this one of simply being born that way. We have brought it forward out of the past as some comic burden we have to carry. And nature has been constantly prodding us to make the adjustment, has penalized us with unhappiness, hoping that we will meet the challenge by doing something to break through this isolation. But as years go by and we do not break through, then the patterns grow stronger and stronger and the heavy comic burden seems to descend upon us with all its weight. So if you look back through life, you may not look back and find uh, obvious instances in which you were hypersensitive because no one experiencing only their own nature knows whether they are hypersensitive or not. You do not know how normal your reactions are in the term of someone else's because you can only know your own reaction and you can assume it to be normal. But if you observe, for instance, that from the very beginning of life, other people have picked on you, that is your quickest way to find out that there is something wrong with you. It, you, ha you, have to, you have to see your own problem reflected. If you happen to remember back that you were one of several children, that the other children did not seem to be picked on, but you did, that you were sort of picked out as an ugly, ugly duckling and got all the responsibilities and blames that there were, then pause, because it was undoubtedly your reaction to a family situation. Your own hypersensitivity probably caused your own parents to have difficulty in handling your equation. And as a result of this difficulty, certain antagonisms may have risen in them. You probably also were too big a psychological problem for your brothers and sisters, so they finally left you alone. Also, if you had a certain kind of temperament, it is very common to be picked upon. Your own reactions encouraged other people to annoy you. So by degrees, if you look back and you can say to yourself with the most pious uh, sincerity that you were born to be miserable and that other people have always taken it out on you, then you can sit down quietly and decide that you are one of these hypersensitive individuals who is trying now to make a virtue of being hypersensitive. Therefore, not going to be very popular. Or in another case entirely, you may have risen from a comparatively normal background. That you do not have these early experiences of other people being particularly against you, you were going along rather well in life until a series of emergencies arose. Perhaps a poor marriage. Uh, perhaps an unfortunate business relationship. Perhaps your difficulty arises distinctly from 
not being in the proper place, that you have gradually uh, hushed up or silenced too large a part of your own creativity, that you have gradually compromised the internal principles of your own life and therefore have to live with something that is not your true expression of yourself. You may be discouraged and figure, well, we might as well let it drift along. It's too late now to do anything about it. That is another kind of person who finds it difficult to be socially inter integrated. The third kind, and as a large group, is the individual who has simply never become interesting. And the person who has never become interesting is almost always a person who has never been interested. Or, if he's been interested at all, it is in subjects that are of such little interest to others that there is not much companionship or friendship through these fields. I think we are developing in the worlds of science today a great many of these uninteresting people. I think materialism in general has a tendency to generate them in large groups. An individual who can think only of, in terms of mathematical equations is not likely to be a great social success. An individual whose mind is deeply rooted in mathematics, biology, physics, electrodynamics, who is a, an electrical engineer uh, or a constructional engineer or someone whose whole life has become immersed in laws and principles of structure, who has become so fascinated by amoebas that he can't see anything else. They are isolated from almost everyone except other people like themselves. And these people also find their own conversation highly boring. Very few engineers really want to talk engineering day and night, but they do not know how to talk anything else. The same is true in many forms of big business. The successful individual whose mind is completely dedicated to some particular intensity, who spends his days and nights wa watching the stock exchange, who has all these uh, comparatively rare intensifications of attitude. Such persons are just not interesting people. Their personal lives fall apart. As a result of this falling apart, they dig deeper into the one subject that seems to hold their attention. And in the end, they are completely isolated within this very small abstract world in which they live. Thus, lack of broad interests will prevent us from knowing people, understanding people, and sharing with other people in the more intimate and natural relationships of life. To be interested in a reasonably wide area of activity is what nature intended. Nature gave us faculties to be used as generally as possible. For example, there has been considerable research in recent years on the problem of optics. And, of course, we know that in the course of time, our optical equipment has been very greatly modified by our own interests. It is the finding of a number of learned groups that man's eyes were in not intended primarily for close work. Man, through thousands of years, has adapted his sight to such problems as reading, mechanical draftsmanship, the use of scientific equipment, and things of that nature. But man's eyes were primarily given to him in order to see things in middle and great distance. The individual was not given an optical equipment to be used essentially in less than a six to ten foot range. Anything within that range he has adapted. 
Also, he was not given equipment primarily to be used with artificial light. He was supposed to stop seeing when the sun went down. Nowadays, he does some of his best looking after that time. <laughs> he was given his eyes with which to observe mountains, valleys, the dangers of the path before him. He was given his eyes in order that he might skillfully hunt for his food or that he might uh, wander about various areas and find his way home. Gradually, however, he has changed this sight problem, but he has not changed the basic sight need which he possesses. And one of the common exercises for correcting faulty vision is to alternate uh, sight in activity. If we stare with the eyes, the eyes fatigue almost instantly. If we stare with the mind, keeping it fixed continually upon one thing, it fatigues very rapidly. We save the eyes by exercises of shifting the point of view, and as common exercises we learn to look at distance, at middle distance, and nearer objects, and alternating them. And we know that nature keeps the eyes in constant motion on various focal levels in order to preserve sight. This is just one simple example of how nature seeks to generalize whereas man is forever trying to specialize. In specialization, we gain intensity and depth, but we sacrifice breadth and area. Beyond a certain point, this intensity becomes pathological, dangerous to us and destructive of everything that we really want to enjoy and appreciate. If, therefore, we come to uh, middle life or even early maturity, finding that we have this peculiar sense of our own differentness. It means we have to think about it. And having thought certain things through, we have to do something about what we think. And there is one of our big problems. We often solve our own problems in ourselves, but do not have the courage or the patience or the continuity to apply the solutions which we have discovered. Without achieving the solution by action, we never correct the problem which arises from wrong action. If we see, for instance, that our attitudes and interests are becoming distinctly different, if we define that there are just little hints all through our natures that we are turning against common experience, if we are finding it more and more difficult uh, to uh, join with others in simple activities. If we are using past pain or past tragedy as a censor upon the future and are never willing to try something again because it hurt us once, if this type of thinking is arising, it has to be stopped changed or redirected in some way, or we will ultimately be forced to live in a melancholy state of personal relationships. <laughs> Let us therefore take one rule that is beyond doubt the wisdom of the ages, that regardless of whether the results are happy or unhappy, action is more important than inaction. It is far better that the individual suffers some more than that he does nothing. It is, it is better to make a friend and lose him than never make him. It is better to have optimism and try again than to develop over caution and be afraid of action. If our attitude is basically right, if it happens that the situation does not come out well, we have still learned something. We have continued to try to do the things that we believe to be right. And in the human relationships and in social adjustments, we are never defeated 
until we cease trying. And at that moment, the defeat is complete. So we must not assume that a previous situation represents a pattern which cannot be broken. We should also be mindful of the wisdom of the old Chinese, who is supposed to at least to have said that the first time something goes wrong, it can be anybody's fault. The second time, it is probably something wrong with us. The third time, we know it is ourselves. Because life does not produce enough similarity in other situations. Uh, to permit us uh, to be completely imposed upon in the same way by several different persons unless we contribute something to this imposing situation. Psychologically, we find an, a very interesting tendency, however, that is almost masochistic in the individual. For instance, in marriage, we find that in the majority of persons, marriage forms part of a pattern. We have not yet fully explained those attractions which bind persons together. There have been a number of different explanations, all of them probably partly true. But there is certainly one factor, and that is that the individual chooses his friends and his probable marriage partner or partners according to a pattern in himself. This pattern may arise from a number of sources. The consistent and continuous tendency, for example, for a young woman to marry a man three times her age shows a pattern. It shows very often the effect of parental overshadowing and a very strong attachment to father, or sometimes the loss of father at an early age and a desperate effort to compensate. I know one case in which a young woman has married three men in succession. Each of the marriages has failed. She is still under 20, and the youngest of the men she married was over 60. <laughs> now this is not just simply a situation. It is not something that is a series of accidents. It is a pattern, a very definite pattern. And this pattern, which of course is terribly exaggerated in this case, in more subtle ways affects nearly all such relationships. Persons have a tendency to marry the same type of person two or three times if they have multiple marriage in their life career. They will almost always marry themselves into the same problem, or one which has so many psychic similarities that uh, it is psychologically possible to understand the difficulties that arise. A woman will say that she has married a selfish man. Finally, she can't stand him, so she disposes of him of course legally and uh, the next man to whom she is attracted is just as self-centered as the first one and she does it all over again why because it is playing upon some basic theme in our own psychology men do the same thing they will pick problem after problem and this will spread through all of their activities an individual who has difficulties with a, a business partner dissolves the firm, forms another for, firm, and gets the same kind of a partner. These patterns repeat themselves. And the only reason why this is possible is because we are attracted to problem. Nature, perhaps, is back of this because this attraction means a problem which perhaps has not been solved over a period of thousands of years. The individual has always refused to face this particular circumstance in his own nature. He has refused to face the peculiarity in his own temperament 
which causes him to fall into this dilemma. The dilemma is therefore repeated, always with nature's hope that someday the suffering person will wake up and find out what is really wrong and stop blaming all the people with whom the problem has come to be associated. We dislike the person that hurt us and blame them. But when these things become repetitive, we should blame ourselves. There is something basically wrong. And nearly always in cases of loneliness and discouragement and things of that nature, there is something wrong in us. I remember another instance of a youngish woman who had been married and had not been happily married was living alone. This person was in perfect health and found great difficulty in making friends. No one seemed to be interested in even the most superficial social relationships. Examination showed also that this woman was living economically far below her capacities. She had a good mind. Uh, she was naturally a nice person in the sense of having strong and constructive convictions and great willingness to help people in trouble and things of that nature, a very good-hearted person. But all their lives, this person had rejected responsibility. And having now to live on their own resources, refused the, respect, the responsibility of adequate employment. They would not take a job. They only worked a little now and then when they had to in order to eat. The problem seemed to be that industry, business, the ordinary levels upon which people have to make a living were so re repulsive to this person that they simply refused to adjust. As a result of not adjusting, their own self-respect was endangered. They, this tendency to evasion of proper responsibility was a phase of a psychological pattern which was not good. And this pattern would continue to plague that individual and almost certainly prevent a happier remarriage. It was a temperamental problem exhibiting itself in numerous ways. The most obvious being this unwillingness to fit into the world in which she lived. The rebellion against business was only part of this basic rebellion against the world and life, traceable back to early childhood situations. So wherever we are lonely or loneliness becomes a problem, there is this great need for careful self-analysis. Nearly always, if this does not reveal the full explanation, then we must go to work on the level of interests. More than anything else that we hear from people who are lonely and who come in to chat about it is the fact that they cannot find other interesting people that if they make any friends at all, these friends bore them to death, that all their friends want to do is drink cocktails and play bridge. Well, of course, this is a gross exaggeration because most of them would be perfectly willing to sit in front of the television. <laughs> but uh, uh, the, uh, this state of utter non-communication is not a solution either. Actually, most persons, are extremely limited in their ability to find interesting people. We look back upon those gay, grand, gay old days of Boswell and Johnson, when in the famous Cheshire Cheese in London, which was an old restaurant there, uh, a dozen or twenty of the world's immortal literatures and wits 
would amuse and entertain themselves hour upon hour, making literary history, and as Boswell points out, then they all went home and uh, proceeded uh, to plagiarize each other's remarks in their next book. This uh, uh, interesting world, however, was a world of people who had things to talk about, things to think about, were out each day observing and remembering, and came together for a, an exchange of values. Interesting people gather to exchange values, and if one of them has nothing to exchange, the partnership falls apart. So one problem is always to realize that there is a shortage of interesting people, that thousands are screaming for them, that they are in tremendous demand. Therefore, if your social life is sagging somewhat, one way to build it up is to be one of these interesting people. Now, what is an interesting person? Well, one who has done interesting things, experienced interesting events, has a world of information that they can share with others, and with these tremendous abilities, keeps perfectly quiet and let the other person talk. This is the secret of success. <laughs> now, actually, this is wiser than we know. For every conversation that another person has with us is our opportunity to learn, whereas every time we speak, we may have the tendency to exhibit our ignorance. Actually, a good listener is a very wise person. Others may babble along and say things that mean very little, but actually no person talks long without revealing eternal principles of some kind. We learn so much that they do not intend to teach us. We learn so much more about life. We gain new viewpoints on ourselves. As we listen to someone else talking about themselves to infinity, we suddenly remember what a bore we probably were when we did the same thing. This is soul growth, and very important to all of us. We will also discover, however, that there are groups that can exchange ideas, and that there are persons who are interested in interesting things. One of the reasons why this intellectual interest has a tendency to go a little sour is because it is not usually associated with activity. You cannot just talk your way into good social relationships. There has to be community of active interests. We have to do things with people. When two or three people get together and plant a tree, there is a new fraternity that could not otherwise exist. Talking will not do it all. There has to be a sharing of action. And most persons are interested in no one's action but their own. As long as we have no interest in other people's activities, no interest in their hobbies, no interest in the reasons why they do things, if everything that we do is important and that everything others do is unimportant, we are destined for a lonely life. But if we share in their interest, we shall discover, as the Chinese learned, that every activity of man is a way of discovering the laws of God and nature. If we become truly observers of life, if we become truly aware of the tremendous opportunities to learn and to understand and to share, we will then not enter into relationships with others merely on the effort to dominate them or to force their interests upon us or to critically compare our interests with theirs, but simply in order to broaden the horizon of our own full conscious life, to discover something about the bigness of humanity, and yet the intimate need that we all have for a certain basic companionship. Loneliness, then, is the result of a false sense of value relating to life the belief that only certain types of intellectuals can stimulate us. This is not true. 
the fact that only certain kinds of people are worth cultivating. This is not true. The, de the desperate feeling that we are wasting time if we are not in continual, uh, profound mental or emotional activity. This is not true. What we have to do is to accept nature. Uh, we think of contemplation or meditation, the individual going out, sitting under a tree, and letting life move in upon him, as it did upon Lao Tzu, the Chinese philosopher, making him one of the wisest human beings that ever lived. We can do this rather well if we have to, but we have great trouble in sitting quietly and letting human life move in on us. The moment someone says anything, we want to contradict them. We are unable to accept the impact of humanity as one of the greatest ways of understanding the mysteries of God and nature. If we have too many closed areas, if we have too many blank areas, we cannot take advantage of this in-moving of life upon ourselves. Thus, if we can richen our own understanding, become capable of becoming receptive to the free circulation of consciousness, I think we will find in most instances our social lives will brighten up a little. There is no crime in sharing the simple and comparatively unimportant activities of others. I know one family that is not at all happy, quite a studious family, when a certain neighbor makes their occasional visit, because this neighbor has only one thing of interest. They love to play cribbage. So the evening is going to be an evening of cribbage if the neighbor shows up. It is discussed and described beforehand and then a post-mortem afterwards that this is a total waste of time. Well, probably it is. But according to some records that I was able to keep on this case, the cribbage game took about three hours, one evening every three or four months. The post-mortems, the anticipatory fears, the discussion in the family of why it was not important took anywhere from 15 to 20 hours. In addition to that, I might have noted that this same family, because it was very responsible, probably spent half of its available time worrying. Worrying about deep things. Now, worrying about things that are so deep you do not understand them is also a waste of time. And out of this worrying came no solution. It wasn't a constructive analysis, it was just blind staggers. So the family that did not want to waste three hours with a neighbor were wasting hundreds of hours. But they were wasting it on elegant subjects, and that made it more important. Actually, the neighbor might have been very valuable to them, because through this slight contact through this occasional game of cribbage, the doors might have been opened to understand these people better to find out what their real interests in life were. They probably weren't playing cribbage all the time either. But in closing off this recreational attitude and worrying about it, bars were built up just as they are in religion or in any other level <coughs> by which valuable opportunities were lost. And we have to sacrifice something for friendship. Friends, we expect to help us in time of emergency. Perhaps they need us. Perhaps they need a certain sharing of attitudes which are not always easy for us to have available at any given moment. But if we want to have a friend, we have to be a friend. If we want the friend to understand us, we must try to understand them. And friendship based upon any value or any level of estimation except mutual understanding will not work and never try to reform your friends. The only way you can reform your friend or your family is live so much better that they become jealous of it. When they come to you and ask you why you are so much happier than they are, then you're right ready to start in and give them <laughs> the treatment. <laughs> but when they tell you or other people that they hope they will never be like you, that is not the time to convert them. So we advise 
discretion in all these fields. Loneliness is just a barrier that we have built, and we can break through it if we want to. But we first of all must know that it is caused by our own nature, and that in order to break through it, we must change our perspective, that we must increase our interests, and do as many people have done who have increased their fields of interest, suddenly discover how important things can be that they never heard of before. In this way, we open up life, and as we open it up, we find other people anxious to share our breadth, but inclined to be afraid of our narrowness. So out of the development of our own cultural life, the improvement and maturing of ourselves as persons, that we become interesting, that we become more or less dynamic participants in action, we will find that this tendency to loneliness is overcome. There is a core of loneliness in every one of us because we can never be fully understood by others. This core, of course, keeps us seeking for eternal values, which alone can understand. But there is also a false loneliness that is simply due to lack of adjustment with life. If we can overcome that and to redirect our careers uh, into a better socially adjusted pattern, our health will be better, our interests will be greater, others will appreciate us more, and we will have a greater sense of fulfillment and substantial normalcy in our own natures. Now, we thank you very much for being with us this morning. hope you'll all go out and make friends right now, share uh, interests with as many persons as possible, and take a little look at yourselves and make sure that you're not narrowing yourself, not cramping yourself of the privileges and pleasures of a constructive relationship with other people. If you open up, I think you will find particularly in these times, that other persons are seeking friendship as never before in the history of our race. And we thank you very much for being with us today.